Nigel Farage Show. Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. The World Cup football has started with Russia coming in with a strong win. No, I'm not supporting Russia, Mr Verhofstadt, or anybody else that alleges that. Um, but let's see how we get on. And the one thing that really made me smile today was the Mac cartoon in the Daily Telegraph sports section showed the England football bus and one player say to another, we'll show the reason, May, how to leave a group of 32 countries on a specified time date. And I thought that was really rather good, because kind of Brexit isn't really going that way, is it? Um, in the course of the last hour or so, uh, we have uh, the Remainers flexing their muscles and saying they're actually rather unhappy. They think they were diddled a bit by Theresa May um, in terms of the amendments they voted for the other day. We'll come to that in a moment. But I was fascinated. The Daily Mail do have a knack of producing great front pages. And this one was absolutely no exception. Conspiracy in Smith Square. And there's a photograph there of Dominic Grieve, the chief plotter in the Commons, to get the uh, Commons to have a, well, he says a final say, but many of us believe actually he wants a veto on Brexit. And guess who he's with there? My stand-in man on the Sunday show, Alistair Campbell. So it's a real coming together. Fascinating who's there. Uh, Professor Grayling who comes on to LBC quite regularly, who seems to have been driven uh, literally bonkers by the whole Brexit process. He's mad about the whole thing. We have former editors of Conservative newspapers, Liberal Democrat uh, peers and MPs, Nick Clegg's former spin doctor, Miliband's former spin doctor, are coming together of people from all three parties. Uh, and where do they meet? Well, they weren't very subtle, were they? They chose the European Commission's HQ in Smith Square in London, which ironically, of course, used to be the Conservative Party's headquarters. So, um, yeah, uh, the chances of them not being seen, I would have thought, were pretty limited. Why were they all meeting there? Well, we know why. Because they all want to stop Brexit. And the truth of it is, they've had a little bit of wind in their sails over the course of the last few weeks. Where the Eurosceptic Conservatives have gone, I have absolutely no idea. I mean, they've gone to ground. Uh, they seem to have given up completely on the idea that Brexit was about taking back border controls and seem to be supporting the government, hoping and praying that it'll be all right on the night. But is it fair, is it reasonable for the Daily Mail to suggest that this is a conspiracy. Is language like this useful in political discourse and dialogue? Well, I have to say, personally, and by the way, we've seen this before, haven't we? We've debated enemies of the people when the uh, Supreme Court judges made a decision. So this is not the first time we've looked at this kind of thing. But conspiracy, I don't think that goes anything like far enough. I mean, to me, they're colluding with foreign powers in Brussels. I mean, this mob are on Eurostar more than I am, and I'm an MEP, and they're off seeing Barnier on a regular basis. In fact, I would have thought subversion would be a better word, because what they are trying to do is to subvert the will of the people in what was supposed to be a free and fair, open referendum in which we were promised whatever we voted would stand and stand for a very long time. And I, looking at all these people, you know, as I say, Campbell and, and, uh, and you know, Nick Clegg's spin doctor and Dominic Grieve, and you probably wouldn't have heard of the others, but I wondered, what is the collective noun for a group of Remainers trying to overturn Brexit? Well, I'm going to suggest a disgrace. That's the collective noun. So I think it's perfectly reasonable. And by the way, I have full respect for people with different political points of view. I always have had. And I hate the mudslinging that goes on. And particularly now on the left. This, I mean, I don't know whether you saw it, but there was a hustings that took place for a by-election that's taking place today. And a particular political group was shouting at members of the public who were going in, shame on you for attending a public meeting. There is way too much closing down a debate. I fully respect people with different points of view to me. What I don't respect is the attempt to subvert the will of the greatest exercise in the history of British democracy. So I'm pretty relaxed about this. I want to know what you think. 
Does language like conspiracy that is used here by the Daily Mail against the Remainers that wish us not to leave, is that reasonable language? Or do you think, no, Nigel, you're wrong. It's simply a different point of view. Just because it's Brexit makes no difference. Call me on 0345 973 Or perhaps you think like me, no, we can go further. You know, we can say what, what is happening here is a subversion, it's a complete disgrace, in which case text to 84850, or maybe, maybe you're actually getting a bit tired of all these underhand games that are going on, Commons amendments being voted on to which nobody fully understands what they mean, including Dominic Grieve, who thought he'd secured a great victory the other evening and now thinks he hasn't. I mean, why not be more open, upfront, honest about the whole thing? And you can tweet your views on that using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And of course, you can watch us on Facebook and have a massive argument there between yourselves. And if any of it, any of it's straightforward, I promise I will read it out. I think the language in this case is absolutely fair and proper. Malcolm is a brand new caller to this show. He lives in Ballam in South London. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Nigel. Uh, it's very good to speak to you at last. Uh, <laughs> Welcome. Have you been struggling to get through, Malcolm? Um, well, I've tried, I, I tried a couple of times and uh, emails and various things, and I, I've been keen to share a few observations and comments with you. Um, well, I was well, I'll tell you what, now you've got your chance, haven't you? Uh, <laughs> right, here we go. <clears throat> I was listening very closely to the show yesterday, and uh, I was a bit confused by what was going on with all the kind of shenanigans and, and last minute. Everybody and is. Deals. Well, my reflection was, and just to set the scene, I was uh, initially a Leave voter, uh -huh. sorry, a Remain voter, who was kind of won over during the debate to to the Leave side of the argument based on the historical arguments and various people have heard comments made. So <clears throat> the, the observation I made was, are we witnessing here the collision of direct democracy, meaning mm. the referendum thing, with... It's kind of colliding with the representative democracy, which is what our normal democracy is predicated on. Malcolm, about. you have put your finger on a very, very important point. I lead, oh. a group, I lead a group in the European Parliament, the EFDD group, the Europe yeah. of Freedom mm. and Direct mm. Democracy. That is the group I lead mm. in the European Parliament. Mm. And mm. I am a great believer, Malcolm, that yeah. since we've had the development of a career professional political class... Incre mm. increasingly on great issues of the day whichever mm. whichever side of the house they sit in whichever country in the west it is they have the same views and i think direct democracy is a better and purer form of democracy yeah it's interesting because <clears throat> the way i was thinking about it you could almost think that representative democracy failed in the sense that it couldn't make they didn't have the confidence uh, to make such a large decision about the future of the country so they escalated it <coughs> to the population the population made the decision, handed the decision down, but you then hand that decision back down to the representatives. Well, we That's weren't supposed to, Malcolm, because we were promised, well, we were absolutely <laughs> promised they right. would abide by our will, but it's not working out that way, is it? Well, no, it's the representatives' jobs to enact it, but that's where the sort of um, all the shenanigans are going on. So yeah. I just think if... If you think of it as uh, the failure or the shortcomings or the, or the boundaries of representative democracy, is that where we're heading again? Is that where the well, conservatives I, I... are trying to get us to? So if we get to that point, do we end up with two options, um, a forced general election or a forced referendum version two? It may well be, Malcolm, if things go wrong, that that is the case. And I would say to you, very interesting, isn't it, that in Italy, the biggest party at the general election with 32% of the vote was the Five Star Movement, who I know very well, and they are advocates of direct democracy. They exercise it within their own party on choosing candidates, on choosing policy. It's an online platform. And they want Italians to have more say through direct democracy. And in Switzerland, they don't just have national referendums. They have referendums by canton. They even have referendums in local districts, if there's demand, on various forms of development. And you know what? Uh, Switzerland is one of the richest, most successful, peaceful, happiest countries in the world. Malcolm, I think the concept of representative democracy belongs way back in the last century. Yeah, just just one more thing. I think if it did get to a referendum version two, surely it must, must, must be the same binary question. Because otherwise, if they try and uh, split the leave vote, 
between things like leaving on DOW, uh, DOW, I know, DOW, I know, DOW I know. rules and and uh, or, or, or a sort of uh, the EU negotiated thing. <clears throat> it, might, it must be a binary choice if we get to another I one. I couldn't agree more. Malcolm, I hope it doesn't come to that, but my goodness me, the conspirators, or as I call them, subverters, who met at the European Commission office last yesterday in Smith Square would love a second referendum. Mark is another new caller. He's calling from Hook in Hampshire. Good evening. Mr Farage, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, and thank you for calling us. Uh, so, uh, Yeah, I'm a big fan, first of all. Um, first thing I want to say before I get on to my point is that, uh, you know, I think the, the, the by-product of this uh, in, indecision and the by-product of what's going on at the moment is going to cause a general election. So you'd be a fool not to take control of uh, your party again mm. uh, and certainly stand for election because I think you'd win and I hope you do. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Mark. Um, <laughs> secondly, I, I feel like a clairvoyant, because I called up last week, unfortunately didn't get through. Right. And I was saying that what's going to happen is that we're going to put ourselves into a situation where the EU is going to say, well, hang on, all we need to do is give them a really, really bad deal, because mm. they've now voted on the fact that they can vote whether the deal's good or bad. So if we yep. give them a bad deal, then they won't leave. And that, it would delay the process and delay and, everything. And that is the collusion, Mark. Yes. That is taking place between senior political figures in our country and Monsieur Barnier, Verhofstadt and other awful creatures in Brussels. I I, I don't think it's premeditated collusion. I think it's more incompetence. I think what's happened is we've gone into a negotiation with a person, unfortunately, that is unable and keeps flip-flopping from one thing to another and is unable to really state her case in negotiation and get what she wants. Um, So, therefore, she's lost the power... And now going to a situation where, and I'm coming from a layman's point of view, I don't really know politics that well, we've come to a situation where actually people get to vote on, or Parliament gets to vote on whether or not the deal is acceptable. Mm. So all they have to do is say, is delay, delay, delay to force control. Delay and make the deal impossible. Mark, let me ask you a very quick question. Time is short. If we'd had a better, stronger leader, would we be in this mess? We wouldn't know. I agree. Mark, thank you. I've got to go. Got to move on. Thanks for your call. Clairvoyant Mark there from Hook in Hampshire. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show. It's exclusively on LBC and it's now 7.15. If Chief Tory rebel Dominic Grieve sits down with Alistair Campbell and a group of other very pro-EU politicians in the European Commission's building in Smith Square in London, is it, as the Daily Mail suggests, a conspiracy? Is that fair and reasonable language to use? I, I'd go further. It's a subversion. It's a complete democratic disgrace. We were asked to make this decision. And I doubt what's happened over the last two hours will cheer any of you up on either side too much. So Theresa May's flagship legislation has once more been thrown into doubt after the compromise designed to keep the rebels, the pro-EU rebels, on board has now been deemed unacceptable by them. So remember... May saw off defeat on the EU withdrawal bill a couple of nights ago by persuading him that she was giving them concessions that would address their concerns about having, remember, a meaningful vote. But today the amendment's been tabled by Brexit Secretary David Davis and it gives MPs no chance to block a no-deal EU withdrawal bill if agreement has not been reached by Brussels by the end of, well, by January 21st, in fact, next year. Instead, he's allowing MPs to vote on a neutral motion, confirming that they've considered a statement by a minister on the issue. And crucially, the statement would be unamendable. And guess what? Dominic Grieve, yes, him again, he's everywhere, isn't he? Do you know, a week ago, none of you had virtually heard of this bloke, but Dominic Grieve has said that it is unacceptable, in my view, it is not in accordance with the normal procedures of the House of Commons, and it totally negates the point of the amendment, which was to give MPs a say. So, she thought she'd won, but it looked like she'd lost. David Davis, from a Brexit point of view, is fighting back. Grieve is saying he won't live with it. This will go to the House of Lords next week. Guess which way that mob will vote? I think I know which way they'll vote. Uh, They will, of course, vote against the David Davis Amendment, and then it will come back to the House of Commons. Whether it comes back to the House of Commons next week, whether that's put off until July, I think remains to be seen. But it is not over by a long chalk. Now, Tom, 
on Facebook takes great issue with me. We talked earlier about direct democracy, about the people taking decisions, not our representatives. And Tom says, Nigel, I think you're using the language of the nationalists in the 1930s. It's a nice start, isn't it? And it undermines democratic institutions in this country. Tom, the democratic institutions in this country are completely undermined. In fact, they're whole below the waterline because of the way they've behaved in the past and the way they've behaved this week. I can't think anybody thinks this is the right way to do parliamentary business. If you think I'm wrong, tell me on 0345 6060 973. Craig says, of course the language is fair. Not only is it fair, it's the truth. They're conspiring to stop Brexit. Uh, Paul says, Nigel, you can't moan about the EU saying it's a dictatorship while not wanting Parliament to get a vote on leaving. Paul, Paul... The whole point of the referendum is we were told normally in a representative democracy we make the decisions. This time you are making the decision. We were told that. We were told our decision, to quote David Cameron, would be final. We're finding out that it's not. And Magda on Facebook says, why are the government and the House of Lords arguing over a vote that's already been decided? I refuse to vote again for any election until this is sorted. And Magda, we had a lot of that last night. Some people last night ringing up angry, others so disillusioned with the whole process. And I met fishermen in Cornwall last week who felt like this too, that they're just saying, if we don't get Brexit, we're just never going to engage in a democratic process ever again. So we are not, I would suggest, at a great point with all of this. Phil, another new caller, lives in Cobham in Surrey. Good evening, Phil. Hi, Nigel. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but... Um, Firstly, I don't think your collective no noun actually goes far enough. What, a um, disgrace? Um, yeah, I think traitors. Um, ah, the T they... word. Yeah, well, a traitor is anybody who um, acts against the interests of the country of which they're a national. And during the referendum, it was made very, very clear that Brexit meant Brexit. It meant leaving the European Courts of Justice. It meant leaving um, the single market. Now, the people that are voting against this are effectively ignoring the democratic process. And I wonder, you have people like Alistair Campbell, one of the most Machiavellian, unelected people who've had their fingers in the, the political intrigue in this country for some considerable time. A great friend of Tony Blair, who has never got over never being able to be EU, pre uh, EU president, or yep. of the Commission or yep. the Parliament. And it would be interesting to see what was promised to all of the people that met with the EU this week. <laughs> Whether, <laughs> if we have Jobs staying... for the boys, Phil. That's what it's all about. Exactly. Jobs for the boys. 16% exactly. exactly. top tax rate. But, Phil, your yeah. point, and, I, I, and I'm completely with you, but, but the other side argue back that actually it's in the interests of the country to overturn the referendum because... As Philip Lee, the junior minister who resigned his post, the Tory MP for Bracknell said, mm -hmm. you know, we basically, we're not clever enough, Phil. We need to be protected from ourselves, as we were over the death penalty. That's the argument the other side well, use. And there's a word we could use for them on that, but we can't that. broadcast it on LBC right now. <laughs> well, I would argue very much against that. I've got an honours degree and no. um, actively campaigned for uh, Brexit. Oh, I thought, I thought we were all stupid. Well, allegedly so. But, um, no, I actively campaigned against it. And what I would say is um, the argument against the point that they would raise that you've just highlighted there is you then look at the embedded career politicians. Now, Stephen Kinnock, being very much a case in point, uh -huh. never had a proper job. Parents are um, sitting in the House of Lords, have been EU commissioners, yet... When Kinnock was um, in the House of Commons, spoke out against the EU, spoke out against the House of Lords, but he's had a very, very lovely um, trough for his um, rather wordy snout. So, well, um, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure he has. You could argue his parents had done very well out of the European no, I mean, Union. Yeah, Neil Kinnock, yes, yeah, no, and, 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 and that would be true. And that would be true. And there we are. We've, we've all got our price, haven't we? Because Kinnock, of course, campaigned well. vigorously against membership in '75. Phil, let me ask you a question. The one, the, the one thing this week that really shocked me more than anything was to see the interrogation of Andy, of Andy Wigmore and Aaron Banks by... And the whole room, every MP, was a Remain supporter, and still is. Yeah. And nearly yeah. all of them represented Leave constituencies. Isn't it about yeah. time, Phil? Isn't it about time, rather than just the Daily Mail 
giving us an opinion, and I think, I think they could have gone further in this case, isn't it about time that Leave voters in Leave constituencies let their Remain MPs know what they think about this? Oh, definitely. But, I mean, to the point you just raised there about Aaron Banks being hauled before a parliamentary committee for alleged Russian links, it's gone very quiet on Peter Mandelson's Russian links, um, some of which well, he has um, picked well, out. Well, I don't know about that. Phil, I have to be very careful about things like that without allowing Peter Mandelson to come on, and that would really spoil my evening. So we must be careful about that. But, 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 but Phil, let's start, to put some, let's start to put some more pressure on our MPs. Now, you live in Surrey. And if you look at the map of England and Wales, the only local government areas that voted Remain were London and, yes, your county of Surrey. So you better go and speak to your local representatives, Phil. Um, well, I have spoken to our MP, Dominic Robb, on it, who I believe... Oh, he's OK. Is, uh, he's OK. Yeah. So, um, very much uh, pleased that he is repre- he's, um, respecting the national vote, which was what it was all about. It was a national vote. vote. No, Phil, great points, great call. Thank you. Uh, Nigel, of course there's a conspiracy against Brexit. These Remainers will carry on trying to stop it. It's just out of order what they are doing, says Cathy. You're right, the Remainers are trying to subvert Brexit. I wish those on the Leave side working towards us exiting the EU were equally vociferous. They don't seem to have the will to get us out, says BB. Well, where are they? Where are they? They seem to have gone to ground. In fact, some of them are now boasting. Isn't it wonderful that since the referendum, we're not discussing immigration? But we've now dealt with that issue. I have to say, a lot of these Tory, uh, very often very posh Tory Brexiteers, seem to have gone pretty soft in lots of ways since that referendum. Let's ask Vicky in Brighton what she makes of all of this. Hi, Vicky. Oh, well, hello, hello, Nigel. Good evening. First of all, I am a very stupid Brexiteer. And well done. Funny. Jolly good. I'm pleased to hear it. A well, real thicko, yeah? yeah? Yeah, because I had a fellowship from the Institute of Directors, so I don't know what level of stupidity I have, but there is... Well, you must have forged it, Vicky, clearly, you I know. I mean, it's not possible. Absolutely, Nigel, absolutely. I think this whole issue is absolutely disgraceful. This is like having a board of directors and a chairman of a company, and the chairman and some of the directors go to negotiate with another company. And behind their back, or perhaps openly, some of the other directors go and meet the other company. Mm. I mean, it's just absolutely disgraceful. Yeah. And I don't think the mail has gone far enough. No, not do I. What are they doing meeting with Barnier? What are they doing? We have a government which is going in, hopefully, negotiating on behalf of Great Britain Limited. These other people should not be having anything to do with the Barnier. They are trying, Vicky, to make sure the offering from Barnier is so impossibly horrible that nobody can sign it. And and actually, you know, the effect of what Dominic Grieve had, 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 had done says to Barnier, don't give them any deal, and then we can take back control in the House of Commons and we won't leave. I mean, they are colluding with a foreign power. Of course, but, you know, so many people I speak to, we're not dumb. We can see what's happening, mm. you know. This is, this is the ludicrous thing. And as for Anne, Anne Soubry, I mean, at least she hasn't burst into tears again, which is something. But, I mean, <laughs> really, really. <laughs> Do you think, Vicky... TV presenter, what, what contract has she ever negotiated? What contract has, 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 you know, the other guy ever gone into i mean they haven't very few of them have ever worked in the private sector very few of them would understand that in any business negotiation the other side need to know that you're prepared to walk away and none of them Absolutely. have that experience vicky a very upset vicky from brighton there and i do understand why you're listening to the nigel farage show exclusively on lbc it's now 7 30 and when political figures as diverse as dominic grieve and alistair campbell meet together at the european commission with a group of their friends is it fair for the daily mail to call it a conspiracy some of you, myself included, think we could use words even stronger than that. But before I come back to that, a related issue. Government announcement this morning, immigration rules to be relaxed for non-EU doctors and nurses. A lifting of the cap because we desperately need people to come in and work in the National Health Service. Two things to say about that. Firstly, from this Conservative government, all you will get 
ever is immigration rules relaxed. Uh, any of you that voted Conservative in the last three general elections where they told you they would reduce the net numbers to tens of thousands a year, you were simply lied to. You've been had. On the specifics of the health service, I want to go back to what was said by the Don Valley Labour MP Caroline Flint yesterday when she was speaking in the House of Commons during the EU withdrawal, because I think it's very relevant indeed. My constituents who have been insulted, those Leave constituents, day in and day out by some of the comments in this place and outside, are not against all migration. But they do want to have a sense that we can turn the tap on and off when we choose, but also they want us to answer the question, why hasn't Britain got the workforce it needs? Absolutely. Why is social mobility stopped? Absolutely. Why do we train fewer doctors? Why do we train fewer doctors than Holland or Ireland? I, I, I'd quite like to be the same political party as her, whatever it's called. It, it couldn't be called Labour, obviously, but she's absolutely right. And we say, oh, we desperately need uh, foreign people to come in for the health service. Well, look at where many of them are coming in from. Many of them coming in from African countries or even one or two southern and eastern European countries where they are needed far more than they're needed here. And at the moment, you know, we simply don't train even enough nurses for use in the National Health Service. We seem to have downplayed this idea that we get people from a young age and we train them with skills, you know, trades or skills, hasn't just got to be the health service, uh, and we rely on foreign labour, and the cheaper, the better. But I promise you, on the big issue of immigration, you will, under this Prime Minister, get absolutely nothing, and net migration will continue at hundreds of thousands of people every single year. Anyone thinks I'm wrong about that, call 03456060973. I would love to hear from you. I would always vote for Remain, I get by SMS. But however, Parliament should respect the will of the people. Well, well done for saying that. And Paul from Perth says, I think the new saying now is not leaving is better than a bad deal. We're not there yet, Paul, but that is is where their argument is going, be in, no doubt. Peter is a new caller to this show. He lives in Chipstead in Surrey. Good evening. Hi, Nigel. Hi. You're welcome. Uh, I, I, would, I, was in, I was interested to hear you say that uh, you'd join a political party that, um, that uh, maybe reflected the views of uh, that, that, that woman MP. Yeah. Um, I have a thought, because I think we've been totally undermined um, by the two-party political system. And I think as long as we play to their rules and we don't think out of the box, we're not going to get a Brexit. And I, 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 I thought of an idea, which is to, for the, the, the Brexiteers uh, within both parties to force a general election yep. um, as, as soon as possible and then to form a temporary, uh, pure, single-issue Brexit party, not distracted by Remainer influences, trying to say election is not just about Brexit, um, but just actually say this is all it's about. And that will be a temporary party. And the commitment is to resign and call another general election three months after a clean Brexit achieved, um, leaving a clear path for the traditional parties to form a new government. Well, this was Jimmy Goldsmith's idea, wasn't it, back in 97 when he formed the referendum party. But, Peter, do oh, you I know... I just thought of it, Nigel. So <laughs> no, no, well, Jimmy thought the same way. I mean, that was his idea. So great minds and all that, Peter, think alike. Um, but, but, Peter, have you any idea how difficult it is to set up and organise and mobilise a brand new political party. Well, that, that's, that, no, that's what I'm trying to say. I don't think there's any point you going back to UKIP because of the same problem. But if you were to say to all the Brexiteers in both parties, if you're genuine about this, guys, mm. temporarily come across to this single party, well. this single rep and if you could lead it, it could be with Brees Mogg as well, and you take, those, you take everyone involved and, and you create a can and you'd have a candidate for each constituency, and those guys are going to resign Peter, after three months. Peter, if we had, if we had an electoral system that was in any way proportionate to how we vote, that could be a flyer. It could work, but we don't. We have a first past the post system, and the likelihood is that if you got a coming together of existing members of parliament from both sides of the house who felt this was the great issue of our day. Uh, and yeah, I'd give them a hand, of course I would. And um, so what happens? Let's say they get six million votes. How many, se how many seats would they get, Peter? 
Uh, uh, you telling me that five re- re-smogs, five re- seats, re- no, six no, seats? I've got far more because whoever is voting for at the moment for a Conservative Remainer and for a Labour Remainer would vote for that same individual in the this tr- Peter, party. Most people who vote don't even know the name of their MPs. Most people who vote vote for the leader of the Tory party or against the leader of the Tory party or vice versa with Labour. We, we, well, that's where the hard work comes in, Nigel. You know, someone's got to do it because it ain't going to happen otherwise because you'll be OK doing what you do on the radio um, and you'll, you'll, you'll carry on complaining about it and you'll, you, we'll have the Conservative MPs doing exactly the same thing. But we won't get a Brexit. Well, I've done a lot more, we Peter. I've done a lot more, Peter, than complain about it. You know, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I nobody has done bare knuckle it. fighting no, against I the know, establishment more than I have. Um, but I the problem, it, Peter, it, is it, the it. problem is we have a first past the post system. As I say, six million votes would get you six seats. Eight million votes might get you thirty seats, but you ain't going to get three hundred seats. It's just impossible. It ju- I think be, I, I, I think even the threat of it, Nigel, would put a shot across the bows because it could split the Conservative Party yeah. forever, and that would yeah. be the only way that you're going to get them to move. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I think that's right. I think, I, I, I think the idea that this electoral threat would win 300 seats in Parliament is, unless we have a total revolution in politics, impossible. But. The idea we could frighten the death out of them, uh, particularly with Labour voters in the Midlands and the North and South Wales and Tory voters elsewhere. Yep, political pressure, Peter, it could work. Uh, And thank you for giving me that responsibility. It's a really, really kind of you. Thank you very much indeed. On Twitter, I get there's no conspiracy. It's just rubbish what's happening. Claudia, many would agree. Ben in Chatham picks me up on a point, and he's right in a way. Nigel, they are not colluding with a foreign power. We are still partners Ben, technically you're right, but we have voted to leave. And just the way, the way that we're working with Barnier and Verhofstadt and the others, I think the whole thing is a disgrace because we're doing it against the settled will of the British people. And therefore, actually, do you know what? I'm not going to concede too much to you, Ben, on that point. Duncan, there's a new caller from Romford in Essex. Duncan, good evening. Good evening. So, was that word used by the male conspiracy, was it over the top? Or wasn't it strong enough? No, I think it's fairly fairly accurate, really, um, because after all, they um, they are trying to subvert the result of the referendum. Yep. I I am a conservative, uh, a member of the Conservative Party from Romford. Um, you may have noticed that my MP Andrew Rosendahl thinks that that Theresa May is going to stand up to this pressure. Yeah, I mean. I mean, Andrew, of course, your MP, who I know and like very much, actually. I went to, I went to a birthday party of his last year. Um, I do like him. Um, he's very, very strong on Brexit. But, but he, d- does he still genuinely believe that Theresa May is going to deliver the goods? Well, uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that she'd have to explain away a heck of a lot of what she said because she's on the record as saying we're leaving the single market. She's on the record as saying we're leaving the customs union. Yeah. And I don't see how she can go back on those honourably. No, but Duncan, when? I mean, is that in 2021 or 2023? Or, I mean, when? You know, I mean, we had a realistic expectation. Anyone voting leave had a realistic expectation from all we were told to think within two years we'd be out, done and dusted. And it's now looking like... It'll be six or seven years at the very minimum before we take back control over many of those areas. Isn't the reality, though, that we've been in so long that it's made the whole process of leaving much more complicated? And therefore, that's a well, large part of the explanation for the delay. Well, it's complicated if you don't believe in what you're doing, I suppose. I mean, there's, I mean, is there a lot of work to do, Duncan? Yes, there is. And it's shameful that the government had no... no preparatory work at all on this um listen duncan uh, andrew can keep faith in his party leader i fear this is beginning to slip through her fingers well I, I hope that's not the case but we'll have to see we'll have to see duncan thank you very much indeed for your call you're listening to the nigel farage show exclusively on lbc it is now 7 45 there's a conspiracy that took place yesterday in smith square according to the daily mail with people like dominic grieve and alistair campbell present they're trying to stop brexit yes they re- 
working to stop Brexit. Now, Pam takes the view on Twitter. She says, if you wish to redefine conspiracy as fact-based, intelligent and widespread concern about the devastating impact of Brexit will have on our country, then yes. Yeah, Pam, that's fine. But, you know, old Campbell here. Now, he was behind Tony Blair when Tony Blair tried to take us into the Euro which would have been a disaster. He was wrong then, and I believe he's wrong now. And even, Pam, even if Alistair Campbell and the others believe in their hearts that Brexit's a mistake, what about democracy? What about the result of the referendum? And can you not see, Pam, why so many callers and texters and tweeters and Facebookers are so angry when people like you know, the Brackwell MP, Philip Lee, tell us we need to be protected from ourselves because basically we're pretty thick. It's about whether you agree with it or not, it's about democracy. JC on Facebook says, since we've been in the EU, this government has just got used to taking orders from the EU and we've forgotten how to govern ourselves. And JC, that's right. Which is why I have to say, Michael Gove, uh, put, putting forward his plans for how we'll run agricultural subsidy in the future with much, much better, greater environmental benefit. He's one of the few ministers really looking and thinking beyond what will happen, you know, once we've left the European Union. Michael, you're doing a great job on agriculture. You're making us think. Can you please do something about fisheries? Then I'd really be happy. Now, let's go to Victoria, who's a new caller of the show, and she's calling from Lincoln. Good evening, Victoria. Good evening, Nigel. Um, I'd like to take up what uh, one of your last comments that you read out. Yep. Um, the, we've been in the common market, the European Union, for over 40 years. Yep. I remember the first referendum. Um, I still got the posters. Right. Bill Sprouts bureaucrats was one of them. <laughs> I still got it. Right. Um, and it, once the decision was taken by the majority, and it wasn't that big a turnout, um, to stay in, that was it. The argument was all closed down. All three political parties, front benches, whether in government or out of it, all said the same thing. They became Taylor's dummies. They just nodded through whatever was done. Um, there was no real discussion on the various um, uh, treaties. And anybody who really objected, in, certainly in the Tory party, were called bastards. So the Leave voters, Victoria, the, the lesson of 75 is that the Leave voters accepted the result and just got on with it, yeah? Yep, that's exactly it. But what seems to be happening now is that for the first time for over 40 years, Parliament has come alive again. They're actually discussing it. In a way, two years after the referendum, they're still arguing about it. We've never heard these arguments before. It's frustrating, but it's actually what our politicians well, should have done. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, do, do you know Victoria, I've, I've, I've long held this view. That if we get a proper Brexit and we're actually back controlling employment legislation, environmental law, all of those things, trade policy, all of those things, I think, Victoria, it would completely reinvigorate our democracy and make general elections and voting really, really matter. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you entirely. It's been so, so frustratingly dull and boring, which is why the turnout at general elections has gone down and down. Yeah, down. yeah, and... and I think, actually, our political figures have got more boring, too. Victoria, thank you very much indeed. And very fair point she makes that 40 years ago, we had this referendum. The Leavers lost. They accepted the result. We moved on. The only difference is the margin then was bigger than it was this time round. Um, OK, where are we going here? I voted Leave, but I'm glad the government is allowing more immigration. That's what I voted for. For our government to determine policy. Kieran, we did vote for our government to determine policy, and I do get that, and we should be debating that sort of thing at general elections. However, Kieran, you know, without, without the belief in taking back control of our borders and reducing the sheer numbers coming in, the Leave side would never, ever have won. Daniela is calling from Maidstone, a new caller to this show. Good evening, Daniela. Good evening, Nigel. Um, cards on the table. I was a Remainer. Uh, yep. I am a Remainer. However, it's a democratic vote, and I do think we should just get on with it to get rid of uncertainty. However, I did take um, slight objection to your comment about the alteration of migration targets for NHS workers, because I feel like you've oversimplified it slightly. Well, I made two um, points, Daniela. My, my yeah. one big point was that under this government, there'll be no reduction of immigration per se. And my point about doctors and nurses was we should surely be training and planning ahead. 
so, so I, I, I think that you're right there, but I think it's a slightly short-sighted view because we can train and, and plan ahead, but that still means if you increase training numbers now, it's five years till they qualify, probably another 10 years bec- before they become consultants, registrars, and therefore we do have a shortfall in experienced doctors, mm. but we do need migration to yeah. help. Uh, Daniela, of course, our population is rising by half a million a year, all of which was unplanned and unforeseen, so we do need more people. I will accept, Daniela, that short term we may well need more nurses and doctors in this country. I will also accept your point that, uh, you know, it, 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 it does take time to train people. But I would also say, Daniela, part of the problem that government has with the nhs is because of our open border policy that we've had for many many years it's been impossible to predict what the population will be i i think i will take as a positive that we actually agreed on something and just <laughs> on, your and, last, on your last point and we did so in a very amicable way but you as a remainer think that basically we should simply just get on with this now because a decision's been made so, uh, yes, um, I'm actually a vet, and the uncertainty is not helping our profession okay. at all. We need to know where we're going. Absolutely. Daniela, you are a true Democrat in the absolute best sense of that word, and I thank you very much indeed for your call. Are you listening, conspirators, to Daniela, a vet from Maidstone? She took the different view to me in the referendum, but she accepts it's a democratic result, and as she says, we need to just get on with it to end uncertainty. Because, you know, when we're told... This transition period may go on for year after year. What are businesses, what are people to think? Even if some of the outcomes of Brexit short term don't suit every business, the point about people in business is you give them the hand of cards and they will adapt and adjust and play with them. That is how the free market actually works works folks it really really is nigel if theresa may had been a stronger leader she would have put these tory rebels in their place or rejected them from the party says mark well yeah but it's a bit late to do that now given where we are she should have made this clear from the very start in my view ken is a new caller from dulwich in south london ken hello Hello, Nigel. Nice to talk to you. Um, <clears throat> Nigel, um, I just wanted to um, make a comment about something you said earlier uh-huh. um, uh, to the gentleman who was talking about the single-issue Brexit um, agenda in a, in a possible um, for New party. election. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you said uh, in response, well, you said that most people don't even know the name of their own MP. Yeah. And I just wondered on that basis how you expected people to understand the terms of the reference, uh, the terms of the, um, the referendum which they all voted ah, for. Ah, because, Ken, there are a, b- somewhere between five and ten political figures in this country who are known by the majority of the population. Mm-hmm. And, and they were always going to be the most influential people uh, in, in, in terms of people making up their own minds and listening to the arguments. Uh, yeah. and, and the interesting thing, Ken, was this. Every single one of those frontline, well-known public figures in that referendum, every single one of them said that if you vote to leave the European Union, and some thought it was good, some thought it was bad, but if you vote to leave the European Union, it means leaving the single market and customs union. Ken, the terms of this could not, frankly, have been clearer. Well, I I take what I understand what you're saying, but I think um, what you're saying is basically that it it was easy to persuade people because um, they were ignorant of the facts. And what what I could suggest is an idea for a second referendum. Oh, no. Oh, not again. Let me just just say this. (laughs) It's all right. Go on. I don't know. I've not. um, I think it's really important to bring the country together. And um, if we were to have another referendum um, based, first of all, on a vote saying um, if you were to have another chance to vote, which would you change your mind as to the way you voted originally? And if, say, for example, 60% of people voted uh, to say that they would change their mind in the event of another referendum, then on that basis we could hold another referendum to see which way, in fact, people would choose to go after that. Mm. Isn't that a bit complicated, Cam? No, I think it's really easy. <laughs> I think that's a way of bringing people, uh, the country together, because it would be a it wouldn't be a loaded question um, initially. It would be just, have you changed your mind? But, Ken, this wasn't the best of three. It was a referendum, you know, and, 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 and I 
rather like Jacob Rees-Mogg. I'm in favour of a second referendum in 30 years' time. Once we've seen how Brexit works, I don't think your plan works, but I know you hold that view with great sincerity, and I thank you very much for your call. Nigel, I'm an EU citizen. I've lived here for 32 years. I've got my own consulting business. If I could have voted, I would have voted Remain. However, today, I would say, just get on with it. And that's the view that genuine Democrats will take. And what is happening here isn't just a conspiracy. It is an attempt to subvert the will of the people in what was the greatest democratic exercise ever in the history of this country. I don't think these people know just how much anger potentially they're going to stir up in this country. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm going to be back here on Sunday morning at 10am. At 10 tonight, it's Ian Collins. But up next... It's Clive Bull. Nigel, thank you.